Mixmaster Jason Joshua joins us. We've got hey. guests in the ITL. And always up, hit us in the corner office with Zan Nakari on this week's Pensado Place. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's uh, Pensado's Place. Uh, I'm Dave Pensado. I'm here with my wingman, co-host. What else? Confidant, mentor. Wow. That makes me older. You are. Oh, really? Intellectually. Oh, okay. But in engineering years, Jay and I are a little older than you. I, uh, that's years. for sure. I have passports. How What's are you, up, everybody? I'm doing good. I'm so excited today. So. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us as usual. Your uh, comments and questions through the week have been great. Dave has been cataloging not only those questions, but also names and stuff. And we're going to get to those. Um, as usual, hit us at the normal places, our Twitter handle, at Pensado Place. Our email is uh, pensadoplace at thisweekend.com. You know, you can go to our Facebook page. Um, we have our man Zan Nakari in our corner office, which is powered by Ustream. Zan. What's up, guys? How you doing? Good, man. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. We got folks in there? Yep. Yeah. Lots of people today. Ready to roll? Yep. All right, so make sure you hit us up, and uh, we'll get it popping. What's up, Dave? What we got? Well, this week we're talking with Jason Joshua, my close friend, and uh, uh, someone I've learned a lot of techniques from. Uh, we're also going to continue our series on vocals and into the lair. We're going to talk with uh, some of the Red Zone camp about how they do uh, record, engineer vocals, all that. You want to stick around for that. That's, that's, that's going to be a really good segment. In fact, it's so good we're going to split that one up uh, in, t for, in two weeks. And then, of course, in the corner office, we're going to convince Jay to stick around, handle some questions from you guys. So uh, let's light that up. Uh, Zan, looks like we got a few already. Um, uh, hey, Hey, uh, Will, Kenny, you guys ready to run into the lair? Yes, sir. I missed, I forgot corner office, or did I? No, you didn't. Okay. <laughs> Let's run into the lair, guys. Okay. Hey, welcome to this week's Into the Lair. Like I said last week, we're going to do several shows on vocals. And so this show, we're at the Boom Boom Room, Will Smith Studio. We're talking with uh, Andrew Whooper and Brian B. Love Thomas. And uh, a part of the Red Zone team, they are. That sounded like uh, like Yoda did it. A part of the Red Zone team they are. Anyway, uh, um, uh, we're missing part of the team. Coop Carell, who's a, a vital part of the team, does he records vocals and, and produces vocals. Incredible vocal producer and is a good producer in his own right too. I guess I'm an honorary member of the Red Zone camp, right? right? Okay, Absolutely. good. Just want to make sure I didn't lose my Red Zone card. No, no. Do you have different thought processes for different genres and sure. different genders? Absolutely. Just take me through that real quick, B. Well, basically, I always have a basic mic setup. Um, mic selection can go anywhere between vintage to what's going on right now to the newer, like, uh, C800 Sony, back to uh, vintage Telefunken 251, which is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, the U47, classic go-to. If I have one available, I'm using it. Right. But you still got to listen to them because, you know, some of them get beat up. There's been times where, like, it's a 47. Why does my vocal sound like this? It's not my set, oh, mm -hmm. mic pre or whatever. It's the mic. Is there a microphone that you guys use that would shock the world and everybody would say, I would have never thought they used that on sure. vocals? Sure. Um, we use uh, U87 <laughs> on a lot of stuff, um, especially, like, rap vocals. Um, you know, like B was saying, some of the vintage mics tend to get beat up really badly sometimes, especially with vocalists who have really powerful voices that carry. Mm -hmm. They can really, really crush the diaphragm of the microphone. Carry. Like, power oh, in the their carry. voice. I thought you were talking project. about Mariah Carey. No, no. <laughs> well, her, she might be one, too. She, she is one. If you don't have the right mic on her, you're right. just going to uh, crap out the diaphragm. Yeah. Her. Sometimes you need a mic that can really take a beating. So, U87, you know, as long as your gain structure is good, you know, mine... Your surroundings, mind the acoustics, mind the gain staging, and even with a cheaper mic like a U87, you can get a good tone out of it, and you won't have to be constantly monitoring the position of the vocalist to the microphone um, because, uh -huh. you know, in some cases they do tend to blow out that mic. Uh -huh with a more sensitive mic like a 251 or a mm -hmm. U47. What is your preamp of choice? Do you guys tend to use the same preamp all the time or is there a go-to preamp or do you have different preamps you like? Well, I basically use a few different ones, but my favorite is going to be the Neve. Like the 1070, like the 1073. 1073 or the 1081. I mean, I can deal with the 1073 most because I don't EQ that much to tape. 
if anything, I might roll off a little bit of low end, but not too much. Just something I hear. But you would. Um, definitely the 1073. Um, sometimes we may use a crane song, Flamingo. Um, we use that a couple times with um, Kook and his engineer, Josh, who's incredible, too. Yeah, I think the 1073 these days is probably the... It's the yeah, it, it's, it's it like just the, works. It just it colors has the right color has the right exactly uh, characteristics and it's, and it's great for instruments too because it has a direct end. So I use a lot of guitars yeah. through it. Break down what you guys mean um, by gain structure and how you manipulate that to get the sound you want. Well, basically on let's say for instance on uh, like a two fifty one mic, just generally that's what I'm using. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll do, I'll have the artist go in the room. Of course, you know the tracks playing, so they can just start hearing themselves and. I don't have anything set up because I don't know what they're going to do until they get in there. You know, it just, mm -hmm. I might know the song, so their vocal might come in really loud, so I'm not compressing yet. I don't so you're always that. ready to, whatever they sing, yes, I'm, you yeah, got, I'm, I'm oh, adjusting yeah. on the fly. I never use presets because right. I, I can't because you I never start know. coloring my songs all the same way. Whatever song that is, it needs to sound like this. I'm adjusting on the fly all the time. All the time. Too, and every section. Absolutely. And, every and section, section to section, too, like he said, um, you know, you're obviously not going to be recording a really intimate, maybe breathier, quiet vocal the same way as you know Christina belting in a vamp. Like it's you're going to have to adjust. You have to ride the compressor, ride the threshold on the compressor, because in some of those quieter spaces, you know you, you may be setting your compressor to a certain level, and it may be bright. And then when she starts wailing, you're going to be you know killing all the dynamics in that vocal performance. So you constantly have to be adjusting constantly have to be writing, constantly have to be thinking about the performance of the record and and how the record changes from section to section. Cool. So very important to do that when you're recording. You know, never set recording vocals is never a set it and forget it process ever. <laughs> like a rotation. <laughs> yeah, and and keeping you know, going with the with the gain st gain structure uh, thing. Um, there there is a kind of a common misconception out there for the in, in the schools, recording schools and in and, and younger engineers who are coming up that you have to record your levels to Pro Tools as hot as possible without clipping. That's absolutely untrue. Maybe in a 16-bit recording world that was more true, but yeah. now that we're in a 24-bit recording world, you could set your levels pretty moderate into Pro Tools. Um, you know, you have a lot of, you know, a lot of dynamic range and bit depth to work with mm -hmm. within uh, your gain structure. So, you know, set your level to your um, mic pre conservative and then maybe use your output gain of your compressor to use that to do the actual gain staging into Pro Tools but keep it moderate you know like you don't have to be recording super hot um, you know keep it nice in in the middle you know just mm -hmm. listen to listen for it and yeah. trust your ears that's the biggest trust thing your ears, yeah. that's the biggest thing I can I can biggest piece of advice is just trust your ears and trust your instincts my ears are a little larger than bees. Does that mean I'm I'm a better engineer than bees? You might be able to cover more ground. <laughs> you guys have been involved with uh, a lot of different genres. Mm -hmm. Do you notice a different uh, mic mic placement, mic this, mic that, with like say if you're working on a rock project as opposed to like say because you guys do everything from rock. To Celine Dion, absolutely. It's to rap, to everything. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, it is absolutely a difference. Um, uh, a lot of times, we will, will, like B was mentioning earlier. Earlier, we may have a chain that we start out with. Um, like the classic chain we use is the Neve 1073, the Tube Tech CL1B compressor, which is a great tube compressor. Um, my favorite for vocals, and then. We'll go out of that into an Apogee Rosetta 800. We'll go in analog and then come out digital into Pro Tools, and that's how we do our A to D conversion. Sort of on the on the Rosetta, do you use any of the built-in limiting or compressing? Or Absolutely you, not. Not no. when we're recording. Not when you're um, recording. I mean that the soft limit on those is sort of kind of like you know it's it's kind of like its own built-in L2, and and when you're recording vocals, I mean we're trying to get the it's least budget. amount of compression like we want dynamics yeah, and dynamics. if we need to control the dynamics after the fact we can do that after the fact but we, we don't we never like to record with too much compression ever maybe a db or two at the most okay what what uh what's your start off attack and release times do you know them in milliseconds or do you or you just know them by just where the knob goes i just go by, by where the knob is yeah. <laughs> generally like, you're in the I'm 100 usually, to 200 millisecond range yeah, it's on pretty, the attack pretty, you know, 
again, moderate on both. Just, again, just because, depending, depending, it, it, it also depends on the, um, the type of vocal performance you're capturing. If it's a rap vocal, then you may need a little bit faster attack. Um, if it's, you know, depending on how much of the peaks and the dynamics you want to control, you know, if you want the vocal to be really, really dynamic, you may set a slower attack time. It just really depends on the vocal performance you're capturing. You know, if I hear something audibly in the compression that's bothering me, mm -hmm. you know, when we start out, then it may prompt me to make a decision to change something, mm -hmm. but normally we don't really change those two knobs right there. And B, uh, what, what, what ratio do you tend to, to, to use? When I start out, two I keep one, it around three to about three to one, but I usually dial it down. Down meaning yeah, two about to one? To two to one to sometimes even. Well, with the CL1B, it's really sensitive. It's a very so. transparent compressor too. And so. it doesn't, you know. What, does, what, what are you listening for when you make the decision to dial it to a, a Less, well, I like ratio. because we're going to not to tape. We're going uh, Pro Tools, you know, and like the dynamic range on a tape was just so much more forgiving. You know, oh, the okay. distortion sounded a lot better, and you know when you hit tape a little bit mm -hmm. harder. But with this, I just want the actual vocal to be really untouched. You know, it's just right. I use light compression on it just because I don't want to take away from it. So that's why I do a lot of the gain staging on different sections. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, she's gonna be loud here. We'll do that section here. Right. But I mean. Sometimes I get the artist that wants to sing all the way through, so I'm yeah. like, shit, now I gotta get in there and set something. And then, yeah, that's, of course, a different By scenario. By the way, the S word is a technical term. Don't feel that I was cussing. <laughs> For you project studio guys, um, you guys that um, might, might be working in, in your home project studio, um, what advice would you give them in terms of, like, like, say, they're setting up a mic in their room? What would you, how would you approach that? Listen. To the yeah. space you're recording in, please. Listen Absolutely. for reflections. Listen, listen to see what the room. So you guys like. are listening to the reflections in the reflections. Space? See if the room's really tight. See if the room's live. I mean, you listen for everything. everything. I mean, yeah, you just. I mean, when you're recording, obviously everything starts at the source. You know, what are you recording? The source you know, being the singer. The source being the singer, and I see. You know, some people make the mistake of you know they set up the microphone, they walk in the control room, they start listening, start getting levels. And then, you know, maybe they may be hearing some problematic things and they automatically go to the equipment. Okay, what's wrong with the equipment? What's wrong with this? Without it even going into the space and listening to what's going on in, on in there. You know, um, you could go into any room and you may have, you know, some, the, that metallic ping sound. You know, there could be an air conditioning vent. There could be some fluttering echoes in there. You never know. Like, so it's very, very important to go into the room and listen. Uh, this is the end of part one. If you'll tune in next week, we will um, we will show you part two of our our really good interview with uh, Andrew and B. So next week, part two. Thanks for having us, Dave. All right, man. This is, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Uh, we're here with Jason Joshua, my good buddy, and uh, we're going to ask him a bunch of questions. Um, Jay, if, if you're not familiar with him, I, I'm not sure where you've been, but uh, Jay has just finished the. Uh, the Usher album, he's working on the new Chris Brown album, he did Mariah Carey's album, Mary J. Blige, Far East Movement, Rihanna, uh, Diddy, Dirty Money. Yep. Can I stop now, Herb? Well, there's a lot more. Man, I'm telling you what. Let's take a break and then we'll come back to the next <laughs> 20 after that. You yeah. got some more, right? <laughs> and uh, so at this point in time, I'd like everybody to meet Jason Joshua. Jay, what's up? How's it going, everybody? Where, where's my... Hey. How's it going? <laughs> Jay, uh, let's just jump right into this thing, man. Um, when, when, uh, when I listen to your records, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm envious of, uh, of a lot of things that you do, but one of the things that, among several that I love is, is the way you work with, uh, with low frequencies. You seem to, uh, I was just talking with Andrew in the ITL clip when we were doing that about how your ability to just—I mean, you're you're EQing. It sounds like you're EQing in like five dB increments on the low end. Is it just a gift that you hear low end better than than most people? Or well, I mean, you you can't reinvent the wheel. The wheel's the wheel, and it's been the wheel since. I mean, I don't know. I guess when the technique was was first made, and that's by Pop Powers. But with me, I learned everything from you. And then what you do is, is you implement your taste on that certain technique. And, you know, parallel compression has been around for ever, mm -hmm. I guess. 
And you know, what I like to do is I take the original kick, which you know the producer has had. Then after I take the original kick, I take a parallel portion of the original kick, put it in, bring it in together, and then use that kick to reemphasize what I'm trying to get from the original kick. Uh, uh, most most people watching know that uh, Jason and I work at the same studio along with Manny, and uh, so we're always walking in each other's control room. And, I, and when I, sometimes I look at your board, and like 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 on the bass or or the kick drum, you, you're 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 EQing very narrow bandwidths and very very small amounts. Is that part of the process? Is, is that how you you get the EQ? You get the uh, bass and, and kick to cohabit the same space? It, it, Is that a word, Zan? Co inhabit the same space? It depends. It depends on which one you want to win the battle. If it's the kick, then you know I will spend quite a bit amount of time on the kick. You'll take the original kick, and I might parallel it five different times. I might parallel. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You might parallel the original kick five times. Five different times. I might parallel it with the tick for the top part. I might parallel oh, okay. it. Okay. And give it some really, really low end, anything below 50 hertz. Mm -hmm. I might compress it extremely hard, you know, depends on what you're trying to go for, so it could be used with a 160. Sometimes I'll do it inside the box with the SSL compressor. I will smush it so it's controlled, and then I'll add low end back into it, and then push that back into the original kick. In terms of, in terms of um, um, the process, are you, are you doing mostly in the box this process or mostly a combination or just whatever you feel at the moment? Originally before Pro Tools started to, um, to, to fix their latency issues, you couldn't do this. It was virtually impossible. But what I tried to do <clears throat> was with your technique, which I believe you got from Bob, um, is you take the 160X, mm -hmm. you compress it to where it feels comfortable to you. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the record, the taste uh, uh, of the mixer. But you take that kick, you compress it till it feels comfortable. Then I'll take the pull tech, which everyone knows is one of the best low-end EQs around, um, and I'll add whatever frequency I think is best. You only really have two choices. That's 160. Anything below that, sometimes you want to go a little bit below that. But it, nowadays, with, with with mastering and trying to get the hottest track out there, anything below you know 50, 40 hertz gets rolled off anyway. But I'll take that. I'll add it back. You know, add it probably to around about 7 dB of 70 hertz at a very small bandwidth on the Pultec. Slowly add it back in, and I usually add it back in first with the NS10s being my reference. And everyone who's ever worked with me will let you know I change NS10s about twice in a week. You know, when it starts feeling, it's almost like an EQ, you know, a, a, a EQ barometer with me. When an NS10 starts to fart or starts to make a noise that I know is too much low and then I know to myself like okay I'm going too far so I'll add it back in slowly till it feels really tight really comfortable so I can push the NS10s as hard as I can and a lot of people will always come into my room and when they're hearing the mix they'll be like wow do you have a sub on your NS10 I'm like absolutely mm -hmm. not it's just I can verify that guys uh, I walk into his room and I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm swearing there's a sub in the room with what he gets out of the NS10s that, yeah that's cool uh, a little bit of background mm -hmm. on Jason Jay is um, uh, Jay is the poster child for, for my concept that learning how to engineer something is a lot easier than knowing uh, what to engineer. In other words, uh, I can teach a lot of people how to get a snare sound, a good snare sound or a good vocal sound. I just can't teach you what one is. And Jay came to the process with as good a taste, if not the best taste, of anyone I've ever seen, and and then he worked really incredibly hard to get his engineering skills to catch up to his taste. In terms of of the compliments that you tend to habitually get, what percentage of those compliments are a function of your taste or or a function of your engineering skills? I I would maintain and guess that it's, it's your taste. I mean, you you just can't teach oh, that. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's. I would say the compliments and the work that I get is 100% taste. I mean, I'll, I'll never be, you know, I guess watching the last episode, what Manny said, one of those, the better technical engineers. There's a lot of them out there, but nowadays it's, you know, people 
are going to the upper echelons of mixers because of their taste, because of what they can add to the record. Like, I don't want to say anyone can make a record sound good, but a lot of people can make a record sound good. But what they can't do is make a record sound completely different than what the producer had envisioned, but yet add to what he, you know, his vision. Like, he will not expect, you know, a certain sound or a certain thing that you've added to the mix, and he'll be like, well, I never thought of that, and that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do that, you're, you Are you know, talking, th these things, are these things like, like production things, or like sound, um, sound, sound things, or a combination, or it varies across the board? I, I don't advise the, yes, they're production things, but I wouldn't advise you to do that when you, you know, first start working. depends on your working. relationship yeah, with the client. definitely depends on the relationship with the client, but the main thing is, is when they walk out of that room, it's an experience, you know? It's not like, oh wow, that sounds great, because there's a lot of people who can make it sound great, and you know, with Pro Tools, a lot of people are making it sound great with rough mixes, so they have to have a reason for spending the amount of money with you. You know, people are spending ridiculous amounts of money on these mixes, and they need to walk out of there like, oh, I see why I spent this amount of money. So it better be just something more than a good sounding kick. Okay. To, to, to your point, it's interesting you say that, because I always felt, from a manager's perspective, and that's how our relationship actually evolved. Speaking of managers, we have Damon Thompson over here, by the way. All right, shout Damon. out, shout out, shout out, Damon. But Damon. Damon, come here, come here, Damon, come here, come here, Damon. Get on camera. Come on, man. Go on, go on, All right, light up the chat room. We want to see Damon. Go ahead. Um, but I always wanted you to be able to add, or whoever we hired, to do something to add something that. The net result, whether it was nuanced or production, didn't matter. It just was a better record. Like it came in one way and came out better. And so I didn't ever want it to just, and my clients never wanted it to just be, here's a producer's vision, just enhance that and go forward. It was like build upon it. Because I think technology blurs the line between the whole production engineering thing. You guys. Nowadays, yeah. yeah it's it, just a completely different process. No question. Hey, Jay, um, I, I recently spent some time. Um, flat on my back and uh, had the chance to listen to a lot of records and I, I, I was listening to a lot of, of uh, different CDs and I, I made a, a conscious effort to not look at who did them and it, invariably it seemed like 70% of the times the, the things I liked were your mixes, your records and one of the things besides the low end that I, I recognized as spectacular was, was you have a gift for um, vocal effects. I think you're probably the most unique cat out there in terms of the way you, you use vocal effects. When I hear, when I'm in your control room and, and you hit stop, I hear delays going on for six weeks. How are you getting away with that? I mean, it's not, you're not clouding up the mix, you're not, you're not uh, drawing my ear to the effect as much as you are just amplifying the sound of the vocal. Is there something you can share with our, our viewers in terms of how you're, you're making the effects make the vocal sound better rather than drawing people's attentions to the to the effects. I think you're probably the top guy at using that that system right now. Well, to, to, to not make the story too long, I come from a team and, and part of that team was the two of the individuals that uh, you interviewed on Into the Lair, Andrew and B. Also part of that team is a guy named Tech uh, and the, the patriarch of the team, so to speak, is Tricky Stewart. Mm -hmm. And Kook. And Kook. And Kook. Well. Definitely Kook. Yeah. Shout out to Kook and his ping pong. We're talking about the red zone team, guys. His ping pong delay. Um, <laughs> he, um, basically with Trick, you know, kind of where I got my whole, you know, start from with you, um, is he doesn't like dead space and neither do I. You know, me, me, me and Tricky Stewart, um, super producer, hear records the same way. And with that, if there's dead space in the record, especially on an up-tempo record, you kind of fall into a lull. So what I like to do is to keep that almost like a hi-hat and keep that space, you know, no space. You know, so you're keep, using mostly quarter keep the attention of the consumer. Well, it depends. I mean, and that's another thing. You, you, a lot of people will bring up, you know, whatever effects they have and just like, okay, quarter, 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 quarter. But each, you know, word or each, you know, part of the song might, you know, want to be interpreted a little bit different. So you might go from a quarter, you might go from an eighth, you might go from an eighth triplet. It, it depends on what that, you know, phrase or that word is saying mm -hmm. and what it calls for. So, you know, I'm huge on never leaving, 
you know, a huge space in the song, keep the attention Keeps of the, the consumer. You, you what's your me? what's your go to delay? Like I know you I know you so I know you, I know you use several, but the, the, the trick is is this. What what I can tell everybody is when you come up with a cool delay and when you come up with a cool, you know, save it. Always save it and keep it in your template. Your I, delays are eighty or ninety percent in the box? All my vocals, one hundred percent are in the box. I you cannot do like the people who, and that's the difference between technical uh, engineers who probably like to stay outside of the box because their comfort zone is, you know, the out, outboard EQ. Even though I do use the outboard EQs, mm -hmm. but I'll insert it, you know, inside Pro Tools. So, but what for what music is now to mix, even though I'm 100% outside the box, mm -hmm. I do my vocals in the box, sub it out to to you know, a stereo pair of faders, and then, you know, go right back in, and then, you know, individually do each stem. But initially, everything that I do is in the box, because what you can do in the box cannot be out, agree, you know, outside I the box. You can't, you know, manually DS, you can't manually do each word EQ. I mean, there's so many things that you can do, and especially with the effects, there's, it, it, you would need to, to insert maybe, you know, on a certain delay or, or an effects that I would use, I, I might use all ten inserts, you know, just to get one, you know, one effect. So it's, it would be impossible wow. to do that outside the box. Wow. Um, Zan, have we got anything from? We've got plenty. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with um, um, Ed Newick in the chat room wants to know from uh, Jason if you have a favorite plug-in or EQ or compressor, compressor that you use frequently. Hard question. <laughs> <clears throat> no, actually it's not. Um, I. I would advise everyone who, who you know wants to be a, a mixer or a producer who you know wants to mix their own records to to find that compressor or EQ that they know backwards and forward like you can be a slave to because there's an infinite amount of EQs and an infinite amount of compressors that you you know you're like oh man I want to try this I want to try that but if you don't understand the color you know even with plugins if you put a compressor on your and and set the th you know whether the, the threshold and the ratio nominal, so it's doing absolutely nothing, you can still hear the effect mm -hmm. just by putting the plug-in on and adding that color. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of, you know, we do with outboard gear. You know, mm -hmm. you might, you know, have like a bass, and you're like, wow, I wish I could add a little bit of, you know, that low-mid harmonics, so you're like, without EQing. So you'll put a Fairchild on it, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, it's a little bit more rounder, and you're not even touching, you know, the, the, the compression. So I, to me, and it's going to sound crazy, since I'm old school and vintage, I like the R compressor. No, I do too. I, I mean, because I know it. I know every preset. Remember that little preset that we we, oh, we that used you to... fell upon. I'll I'll never forget it. I'm I'm yeah. assisting Dave, and he has this rap vocal that was basically an inch from my face, sounding extremely thick, pure. Like oh my, I was like God, this is the greatest rap vocal ever. How no parallel compression to to to. To make it sound like that, so I'm like, wow, how's he, you know, have it like that? And there's no parallel compression. It sounds right there, like he's whispering in my ear. And next thing you know, it, I look at the R compressor, and he has the ratio all the way slammed down to 50, and he, you know, the threshold's probably, t you know, he's probably taken off about six, seven, eight dB, and it just, ever since then, you know, and and I asked Dave, I was like, Dave, how did you do? Like, what made you do that? Like 50? Like doesn't even. He's like, I accidentally hit it, and it got there, and you know me, I listened to it, and it sounded great. Do I sound like that, Damon? You sound like that, Damon. Damn. Damn. That's pretty funny. What else, Dan? Uh, question, how many different reverbs or delays do you use to get a good ambiance for both of you guys? Uh, well, I mean, if I answer this question, it's, it's going to be just like Dave answering the question because, you know, I would say 99% of what I do is from Dave. That's why I like you so much. Um, yeah, that's why you like my son. <laughs> but, uh, hold on, hold on. He's being very kind. Jay is taking what, what he, I'm not even going to use the word learn, what he picked up from me, he, he already had that taste, and uh, he's taking anything you learn from me to it. This is the whole next level, but go ahead. So um, it depends on the vocal. Like right, right now that we're in a, in a um, in a time period where you know it's a battle between reverb and no reverb and, and and it depends upon the record and 
most of the records that I'm doing right now are really, you know, dancey, four on the floor, pop, you know, rhythmic type records. And those type of records right now are are really dry vocally. You know, it and it what what's good about that is it leaves you a lot of space to do all your other stuff. And it's kind of like you know the Dr. Dre formula of mixing a rap vocal where it's in your face, it's really dry, and when it's in your face and really dry, it gives you space for your other instruments to have fun to play, and you can really, really pick up on the delays cleanly because there's no cloudy reverb fogging up you know, the mix, and a lot of people will over-reverb, if that's the word, their, their vocal or their records, and it doesn't sound as clean and you don't get the depth, but if you put a little reverb, say, just on one instrument that sets that instrument in the back of the record, mm -hmm. that means everything else, you know, it's almost like a steps because mm -hmm. you only have two dimensions, mm -hmm. front and back. Mm -hmm. So the clearer and the cleaner the vocal is, sometimes the more you know presence, the more closeness, and then you have okay, here's the vocal, which is the vocal of the track. Then you can go back to the you know whatever instrument you want there, whatever instrument you want there, whatever instrument mm -hmm. you want there. Coolio. Got one from uh, Milterson. A uh, question for both of you guys. He wants to know if you guys start with a template when you mix, and if there's something you use again and again. Well, you can answer that one, because okay. I got my template from you. Okay. First of all, uh, I guess this would be a good time to go to the corner office, right, Herb? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but since we're in it, <laughs> let's just keep rolling. <laughs> oh, man. Did I miss something here? No, no, no. It wasn't uh, I was supposed to, I just, I, I, you know. Do you I'd... remember the question? <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> we're, we're used to it by now. It's yeah. cool. Oh, man. You get what you pay for here. Uh, what was the question, Sam? The question is if you start with a template when you mix, and if, if there's something you use over and over again. Why wouldn't you? You know, I mean, um, now, I'm going to answer this, let, let Jay answer it too, but um, the, the, the reason that you probably ask that question is because uh, you're scared that you might get in a rut or start doing the same things over and over and over again. Uh, that's something you always have to guard against regardless of whether you use a template or not. But a template can save you, um, I know this sounds like a love fest, but I learned this from Jason, a, a, a template can save you a lot of time. It doesn't, it doesn't condemn you to repeating what you did on the last record. Your template can just make things a lot quicker. And uh, if you watched one of the earlier episodes, I, 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 I did an ITL on my template. Uh, this question is from Funk Mono 2. Um, it's not exactly a mixing question, it's more tracking. Do you have any tips on how to record multiple singers all at once? That's kind of vague, but... Uh, you know what, let's, let, uh, let's save that for uh, uh, next week's ITL, because okay. we go into a little bit of that, and if we don't answer your question, just hit me back. Okay. And uh, Funk Mono 2, you should think about changing your handle. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but also Funk Mono, uh, we, did, we answered your question on an ITL. Um, since we're on Funk Mono, he has a question for Jason. How do you balance keys and bass to have a nice bottom and low mid-range? <sighs> See, all, all these questions are relative. Like, um, uh, it's so difficult answering these type of questions. Really but, is. but, I mean, it depends on what you want. You know, what you want to win. You know, a lot of times the the key is, you know, for a record, the types of records that I do, the bass is usually a focal point. So. You see where you, you, you like where your bass is sitting, and you probably would do the rhythm section first. So with the rhythm section, you have your drums, your snare, and your bass. You set that, you get a nice, like, wow, this, this is hitting, the song is, is jamming. And then when you bring your keys in, you listen to the keys, and you're like, wow, the low frequency that I'm getting from the bass, I'm also getting from the keys. Which one do I want to give you the low end? More times out of, you know, nine times out of 10, it's the bass. So you'll roll that frequency out of the keys so now you have the separation. You know, when you keep that frequency in the keys with the bass, then you're going to get a muddy, you know, clouded sound that's, that's mushed together. You scoop that out of the keys. Now you have the bass that's standing by itself. You're like, wow, I can hear the bass. And now you have the keys, and you might add, you know, some, some high mids or some top end or, you know, add an effect to it that, that, that brings that top end itself rather than EQing it in. And now you have the separation that you're looking for. Good answer. Hey, I'm going to take a minute and do this. Is this cool? Absolutely. Okay. I want to give a shout out to one of my old band members, uh, uh, just one of, one, of the, one of the world's true great guys, Harry O'Brien. Harry owns Atlanta Recording Studios in Marietta. 
give give him a call, and then I want to give a shout out in that it's a predominantly all Larrabee day, Jay. Let's give a shout out to Rachel and John at Larrabee, and uh, TK in Atlanta over at, uh, I always mess this up, Secret Sound or Silent Sound? Si si Silent. Silent Sound. And then a couple of you guys have, have I noticed you keep, you keep emailing, and I wanted to thank you. Uh, Slim Ivy, Master Sound, Mastering Sound, uh, The Grawl, I think his name is, uh, G-R-A-A-L, The Movie Music Factory, Last Day Studios, Dave Perry, Vintage Snare, Alex, N-I-E-D-T, Knight, uh, Linstar, Anything TV, and, and the grand winner of them all, F.L. Frieden. Friedman, we really appreciate you guys uh, listening to us. Have we got time for another question here? Yeah, plenty of time. Okay. Absolutely. Good, good. Correction, it's not Funk Mono. I couldn't read the font. I guess it's Funk Momo, too. Momo, I yeah. see that now, yeah. Um, does so, that change your opinion? <laughs> Still change your name. <laughs> I've got hey, a let me question. say something. Uh, uh, a lot of you guys see the credits that Jay and I put on our records uh, as uh, the Penwa Project. Just a little quick explanation. Jason and I, um, when we were when we were working together a, a lot in the early days, we decided to to have a a little logo that would incorporate future ideas and future plans and and a way to incorporate uh, other people to within what what we do for a living as a way to kind of share the wealth and share the knowledge. So uh, I've had a lot of people ask questions about that. Uh, in the future, you'll see that develop into a lot more things. Do you want, want to add something to that, Jay, about the penwa? I mean, <clears throat> to be perfectly honest with you, I, I have it on mine as, you know, I would put, you know, mixed by Jason Joshua for Dave Pensado Productions if, if it need be, because what he's done for me in, in my career is, you can't even describe, he changed my life. So it's kind of an ode to Dave, you know, being that we used to mix records together and that's some of our best work, you know, we've won Grammys together and, um, you know, the Penawa Project was was a great period in, in, of my life, but, you know, now as we, you know, move along and, you know, Dave's doing huge things and I'm doing, you know, okay things, <laughs> having that behind my name just means so much to me because it, it was, he, he He's the best, you know. You come underneath his umbrella, you're not only going to be successful, you know, because he's so he's such an open book, you know. I advise anybody who wants who wants to make it in this business to to email Dave, flood his emails, and say, I will wash your car, I will pick up your cleaning, because once you get out of that experience or out of that environment, you will be walking away with an infinite amount of knowledge. That's why I'm always harping on him, like Dave. Please open up a school. Please teach these kids because the schools that are out now, you don't learn anything. Take it from me. I <laughs> learned from one day with Dave what I learned at school times ten, and and you know he really needs to open up that school desperately. Uh -huh. yeah. Thanks, Jay. Thank, thank you so much. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Well, you guys, you guys. I didn't mean to turn into this, but I I really appreciate you saying that, Jay. Appreciate you saying that, Jason. Uh, one ten percent. One of the things, uh, one of the, one of the reasons we we decided to put this show together, Herb and I, is is uh, uh, to to kind of get some of this information out to you without you having to wash my car and get my laundry. So uh, don't email me. As a matter of fact, from now on, remember, you guys are keep forgetting this from week to week. All questions from now on need to be true, false, or multiple choice. Dave, I'll wash your car, pick up your cleaning. Hey, here we go. <laughs> But, you know, Jay knows what I know, so email Jay at uh, Jason Joshua at, uh, I couldn't think anything funny. Fill in your own blank. Another question, Sam? Yep. Fred in the chat room wants to know um, how, how you can make some elements fairly loud in the mix, for example, drum bus especially, without killing the transients. Read that again. I, okay. I, I, um, I had an answer before I heard the whole question. I have to change my answer. Now. How do you make some some elements fairly loud in the mix? For example, the drum bus, without killing the transients. So how do you push that level? Mm, that's a good question, isn't it, Jay? Um, well, the obvious answer is that you can use a slower attack time on your compressors, but the 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 go-to way to tend to make things louder is compressors like uh, the L2. And there's a, there's a whole series of compressors. Steven Slate has one. Uh, 
Massey has one that, that allow you to, to, to get that and accomplish that technique. Explore some of the non-traditional compressors that, uh, that are designed excuse me, that are designed to do that. And then if you're using more traditional compressors, uh, Jason mentioned earlier about the attack and release times. Uh, experiment with that. Go to um, uh, Michael Brower's website. Uh, also, Mick Kozowski has some great information. If you, if you type his name in, his last name begins with a G, on uh, varying attack times. There's a lot of good information about uh, different compressors. Um, a great compressor that you might start off with. We mentioned a lot of this earlier when we were talking about uh, bus compression, like the 2500 API. That thing's a monster. It, 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 it's, it's like the sledgehammer of compressors. Um, I'll, in that that answer is kind of vague that I gave you, and it's kind of... Very vague. It's very, it's very difficult. <laughs> so, sound like a mixer I know. I sound like you're... Yeah. Ooh. And... Uh, uh, we'll try and delve into that a, a little more, but uh, I can give a quick answer for the people. I like who the just, I like the transient thing because transients yeah. are something we're going to do a whole show just, on. Just to give a quick answer for the people who just want to have it sound real good, real quick, without thinking, because I love that. I'm a big fan of presets. <laughs> um, the the L2007 by Massey is absolutely far superior than most of the you know compressors or limiters you're going to use. And if you put that on your, you know, your drum bus and you just bring the threshold down, what it's going to do is not only make your drum sound really loud, but it's going to keep that transient. And it also adds the mid-range that you need to give it that loudness. Like a lot of people don't realize, but you know, I remember you teaching me this, mid-range equals loud. It makes you feel like your, your mix is louder, like your drums, your snares are louder. And the cool thing about this is when you squash it and you take off those initial transients, it masks it by at, adding a little bit of that mid-range. Mid -range. And, and you only get that on the loud preset. If you take it down to like uh, vibrant or, or mellow, um, it doesn't really give yeah, you that. I use the loud with the, release, with the medium, the bottom Absolutely. loud I put on medium. Absolutely, so that's a real quick one to go to. Hey, Zan, yes, two more questions, sir. Okay. I've got one from Ravian in the chat room. He wants to know both of you guys' approach on automation. Do you do it on a track by track or section? What, what's your approach? Um, it depends. I'm a huge fan of automation. I'm a huge fan of Pro Tools um, or Logic, whatever platform you're using. I, I, I will, I'd rather automate than compress. I'd rather automate than de you know, put on a de-esser. Um, it totally depends. I will automate every track pretty much on every mix just instead of using because you know a lot of people don't realize as soon as you put a compressor on your track you're basically changing the sound now if that's what you want to do that's great but if you all you're looking for is is you know dynamics you can draw it in you know you can draw it in exactly how you want it you know you you, you have a vocal that's you know really you know essy you know really a lot of syllabus you you draw them out, you know, you scoop them out, you take them down. You, you're a huge fan of automation. Automate everything. So let me put you on the spot and ask you a question. Um, would, it be, would it be an accurate statement to say that compression is automation? That, 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 that's, that's, that, 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 that if it, is automating a sound, like let's say we've got dut, 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 and the, the middle dut is louder. If I just pull that down, do I get the same effect is if I put a compressor on it, pull that down and then no. crank the level back up? Absolutely not. Compression is, 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 is EQing, you know? Compression is coloring your mix. So what a compressor does is, is it changes your sound, you know what I mean? So you have to analyze that sound. If you're, look, you're saying to yourself, I love the way this sound sounds. I just don't like it loud here and I don't like it low there. So that's, that's, when, EQ, auto that's I mean, when automation volume, comes yeah. in. But when you have a sound that, you know, needs color, um, you like what a compression does with a slow, slow release time, and it makes the vocal sit right in the middle and not jump up and down and, and, and feel right in your face, you know, then you go with the compressor. But, you know, nine times out of ten with me, part of the first process of me mixing is fixing every track. And, and part of that is, you know, the inherent level. You might have a percussion track, you're like, oh my god, this sounds incredible, but then all of a sudden one bongo 
you know, hits <laughs> 20 dB louder than everyone else, you're like, huh? You can easily put a limiter and compressor on it that, mm -hmm. you know, changes the whole mix, or you can automate it or audio suite mm -hmm. that specific part down, and it's a lot easier. It's mm -hmm. tedious, you know what I mean? Yeah. But we have assistance to do that. Yeah. Hey, Herb, I got, I got to do one thing. I, I, I just came up with a new segment. I'm going to call this new segment Ask Jason. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to name, a, I'm gonna name a, a sound, and as quick as you can, just name a compressor that you would go to for that sound. Awesome. In the box, out of the box. Awesome. Now, that's kind of neat, huh? Herb? Absolutely. I just and thought that, of that. That'll be our last <clears throat> Okay. So, so, so we're, let's do this quick. It's like a, like a psychological Rorschach test. It doesn't have to be accurate. Just quick. Okay. Vocals. CL1B. Bass. Uh, Leb 76. Leb 76. Okay. Uh, kick drum. Kick drum, uh, 160X. Snare drum. 160X. Uh, acoustic piano. Uh, Neve, depends on what kind, 33609. Uh, help me out, Zan. Uh, buzzy synth. Fuzzy synth, R compressor. <laughs> <laughs> what? R compressor. Oh. Uh, huh? String section. String section. Strings, it depends. If you want a metallic type sound, I would go with the uh, 1176 or maybe LA3A, but um, it depends. If you want a warm, you know, I, I love a Fairchild, but a lot, of, a lot of people can't afford a Fairchild, but I will say the plug-in is amazing. And, uh, and shout out to Jack Joseph Puig, wherever you are, in your Captain Crunch jacket, you are <laughs> one of Jack is amazing. He's on another level. Amazing. I can't wait to, you guys, when that interview comes with these two guys, Dave and his 15 degrees uh, in biology and chemistry, whatever they are, and Jack Joseph Puig, it's amazing, these two <laughs> talking to each other. I just, I remember we were demoing out some speakers from KRK. And then they started talking, and I was like, dude, am I this dumb? Like, really? <laughs> am I this dumb? True. There's no way <laughs> I can be this true. dumb. Well, guys, um, I, could do, I could do a full week with Jason. Jason is, as well, you can tell, is one of my favorites. And, and uh, uh, we've given you a lot of information, and we've given it to you quickly. There was, there's little tiny things. I want you to go back and listen to Jay's interview because just the little t statement that he tossed out about the metallic sound on 1176, there's about a hundred of those kind of little things that you want to go back and listen to. Uh, everybody's got uh, plugins, Pro Tools, they've got Logic. Experiment with some of the things that he said. Let's remind them, make sure you reach out to us, same places, Twitter, at Pensado Place, email, Place at thisweekend.com, Facebook, our corner office. Remember, you can send us questions in between time that we'll get to. Next week, we also have a very special guest for you. Maureen Droney's coming in. She is not only the head of the engineer and producer wing at Naris, she's an engineer. And uh, you're going to get some authentic information that can really help you and some of the things that are peripheral to your business that can make your business yeah. better. So, uh, so, Jace, thanks. Will you come back? Yeah. You sure? I'd like to give a, a shout out to uh, Skin Gentlemen's Club on uh, <laughs> Pico. Make sure I get in free. Thank you. Nah, let's give a shout out to Jesus and Drew, the two guys. Uh, Jesus you know what? Yeah, Drew shout out to guys. all my assistants and Dave's assistants that yeah. are now making an extremely insane amount of money and not <laughs> giving any money back uh, to Dave like I did. And Chris and Eric, too. Chris and Eric. Let's get out of here. Oh, let's get out of here. Hey, guys. Uh, Jack Joseph Peep coming up soon. Uh, Michael Brower, my, my good buddy, coming up soon. Oscar so, from Nashville. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dan and Dave Huff from Nashville. We've got a lot of great stuff coming for you. We're going to get a little more rock oriented in the next few days. And then uh, next week's Into the Lair. Be sure and watch that. See ya. See ya. See ya.